atmosphere is charged, eh? Yeah. Everybody comfortable? Not too hot, the air moving enough? Good stuff. I'm happy. Would you please... We, 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 we're going down Matthew 17. So I'm titling this message, um, Be Ready to ex- for Experiences in His Glory. Just mute the monitors for me, please. Okay, so be ready for experiences in His glory. And I want to take you to the Garden of Eden. Right in the beginning, God may creates Adam, and He creates Adam in His image. God is spirit. You know that God is spirit? Okay. So when He creates Adam, He creates him spirit. I want you to get that. But a spirit needs a body to reside in. All right? So God creates Adam. And then he molds him from clay and he breathes in, into him his ruach breath, the breath of God. And then Adam becomes a living being. So the first Adam is a living being. Hebrew says the last Adam, that's Jesus, is a life-giving spirit. He gives life. So Adam starts living, breathing, walking around. And then the Bible says every afternoon he walked with God in the cool of the day. So this Adam, in, just like you and I, walked with the Spirit God in the cool of the day. Now Adam became 900 and 60, is it 60? 960 odd years old. So we don't know how long He spent time in the Garden of Eden before things went sour, okay? Before the missus came along. Oh, (laughs) you know, everything was fine in the garden. (laughs) (laughs) The ice is cracking, you say. But what would happen to Adam spending time in God's presence like that. Even just a half an hour walking with him in the cool of the day, late afternoon. What would happen to Adam? The Bible says the word of God is life-giving, energizing. Okay? Vitalizing. You can read that in Hebrews. It says the word of God is like a two-edged sword cutting between the bone and the marrow, between the intents of the heart and the mind, cutting between soul and spirit. Adam is walking with God. Now, Jesus is the Word. In the beginning, are you following with me? John, let's go to John. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he was walking with him, energizing him, vitalizing him. Giving him something. Something is happening to him every afternoon. He's walking with him. Becoming more like him. You see, in the glory of God, what's starting to happen to Adam? The flesh is not important in this place. He's he's spiritually minded so much. Why? Because he's walking with the Spirit of God. This afternoon. And there's no sin involved. Sin doesn't exist. Death doesn't exist. He's walking with God every afternoon. And every afternoon he gets charged up. High voltage power getting poured into him. Adam, I want you to name the animals. Not a problem. Adam is intelligent. Why? Because God is intelligent. He's made in God's image. So now, the whole caveman theory, out the door. 
Neanderthal, out the door. We're walking with an intelligent God, with an intelligent design. You see, Adam's walking with him. He's experiencing something in the glory of God. The word Eden means the presence of God. So he's in the garden, in the presence, in the glory. Walking with God. So Lord, what can I eat? Well, you can eat of that herb and that herb, but that herb there, the one with the five leaves, you can't eat. Okay? Yeah, but Lord, it's a herb. Yes, son, but it's got no nutritional value. It's got medicinal value. Okay, so you can use it as medicine, but you can't put it in your cupcakes. Okay. All right. You can't. I said, Adam, you can eat that mushroom. Okay. That mushroom, there's nutritional value. It's got a nice flavor. Adam, that mushroom will give you access to the spirit, but not by me. It will open doors. And that mushroom, well, you might not make it. And so, I mean, otherwise, who's the first guy to eat a toxic mushroom? We don't know. He died. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is probably, I've got a new one for you. Ryan, how's this mushroom? Take? Good riddance. <laughs> red is a color of danger. In nature, everything that's red is dangerous. Don't eat. So who's the first person to eat a tomato? See, God told Adam, you can eat that tomato. It's not poisonous. Does that make sense? He's walking in the garden. This could have gone on for 10 years, 5 years, 100 years. Because remember, he became 900 plus years old. He could have spent time with God in his glory. In that time, he doesn't get sick. Does it make sense what I'm saying? All right. God wants us to have experiences in his glory. Now, they, they, there's the place of unmerited favor. That's called grace and mercy. Unmerited favor. There's unmerited favor on your life. Favor that you don't deserve. All right? You don't deserve. We all fall short of the glory of God. Am I right? So we all deserve a hard thing. But there's unmerited favor, unmerited grace and mercy of God resting on your life. So it's the first qualification of having experiences in God's glory is that you don't deserve it. You can't earn it. You can't live up to it. The Ten Commandments is given for that reason. All right? That it doesn't matter how good you are, you can never please God. Stop trying to do that. Are you following what I'm saying? Stop trying to please God by doing the Ten Commandments. The Bible in 2 Corinthians forbids a pastor or a preacher to hold up the Ten Commandments because it brings a veil over the sheep. Go read it. So every time there's a reciting of the Ten Commandments, it's a veil over your eyes. And you become legalistic. And then you become, I have to perform to please my Father. No, you've got to be to please your Father. Just be what He created you to be. That's all. Not a performance. If you're a funny man, be a funny man. If you're a sportsman, be a sportsman. If you're a sniper, be the sniper. If you're somebody that can write, write. If you're a musician, be a musician. Okay? I'm not a musician. I tried to be, but I'm not. I'm failing for 46 years now. But in chapter 16, we spoke about <coughs> Jesus giving us a introduction of what to watch out for so that we can enter into the glory of God and experience glory. And the first one is that do not look for a sign. Do not be 
caught up in looking for signs and wonders and miracles. An evil generation looks. Remember Jesus said that? An evil generation is after a sign and a wonder. You see, it's the same as just loving somebody for what they can do for you. I just love Dudley. You know, I can take my wood to him and he will do all the wood stuff for me. How long is that going to last? Until he cottons on, I only know him when I've got, I need some wood problems. But if I go to him and I love him for who he is, now we've got relationship. And the same with the Lord. If we're looking for signs and wonders from God all the time, Lord, give me a breakthrough in my life. Help me with my sport. Help me with my academics. Help me with my marriage. Help me with this. Help me with that. Lord, please help you. Please do this for me. Please do that. Can you hear what it sounds like? Now, everybody, just put up your hand. Who likes to be used? None of us likes to be used. Okay? So that's why Jesus says, don't be caught on signs and wonders. Be addicted to me. Be in love with me. Love me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. Uh, Matthew 6.33 First seek the Basileia kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Solomon had a visitation from the Lord. Remember? What do you want, Solomon? Fame, riches, or wisdom? And he said, sir, if I'm to rule over your nation, your people, I need wisdom. He's already in a servant's heart, serving. God says, because you asked this, I will add all the others. Doesn't make sense. All right. That's Matthew 16. The next one from Matthew 16 is biblical doctrine. It's Christ-centered, Bible-based doctrine. He says, watch out for the leaven, the doctrine of the Pharisees, the doctrine of a church. Watch out for that. Watch out for the doctrine of a church that says X, Y, and Z, and you cannot find it in the Bible. Because it's not Bible-based, and it's not Christ-centered. Salvation comes by... No, no, that's faith. Salvation comes by confessing your sin. No. Salvation comes by confessing Christ as Lord. Confession of sin is a spiritual bath. It cleanses you. Confession of Jesus as Lord. Romans 10, verse 8, 9, and 10. John 3, 16, forever believed in Jesus, that he's the Lord will be saved and not perish. Salvation comes from it. That's true Bible-based, Christ-centered doctrine. So we have to have that. The next thing is the revelation of who Christ is. Remember Jesus asked the disciples, who do they say I am? And they said, but who do you say I am? He says, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. He says, on this revelation, You see, we have to have a revelation that Jesus is not a mere man. The world wants to make him. Other religions want to make him just a prophet. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. He is the anointed Messiah. He's the Lamb that take away the sins of the world. Blemish, spotless, perfect Lamb. We have to have that. The next thing is be confidential. You see, the minute they get that message, he says, I want you to tell no one. He says, if you want to have an experience in the glory of God, you need to be confidential. And where is confidentially, confidentiality begin to test it? In relationships on the earth. Oh, did you hear so and so? Gone is your confidentiality. God can trust you. So he can't take you into the spirit because in the spirit he will show you stuff that's not supposed to be released until a certain time. And I'll show it to you this morning. There's a a place and time where God wants certain stuff released on the earth and he needs people to do that and he can only use confidential people because he is going to give you a word and he's going to try that word and he's going to purify that word and it's going to take some time and then he's going to say, I want you to release it. It's not time yet. 
It's not time yet. But I'm not confidential because that you hear. Kursi won a million. No confidentiality. That you hear. Peter sponsoring that. No confidentiality. Oh, that you hear. That one's pregnant, ne? That one did that. No confidentiality. What is that? Who is that? What are you talking about now? No confidentiality. God can't trust you. We need to be confidential. The information given to us, because it's not towards people. It shows the Lord, I can trust you. Peter, this revelation that I've given you, it's not from me, it's from my father. See that you tell no one. See that you tell no one that I am the Messiah. Keep it to yourself. Why? Kairos time. Kairos time. You get Logos time. That's chrono Kronos time. The Kronos time. Chronological. And then you get Kairos time. God's timing. When he wants to do something. And if you're not confidential, you're going to leak the wrong information at the wrong time. And the effect of that will be that it doesn't achieve what God wants it to achieve. Does that make sense? That's why many people, they can get married and they will not fall pregnant for 15 years. Nothing wrong, all the tests, and then suddenly they're pregnant. Why? God's timing. Because you, madam, sir, young girl, young man, are born for a time such as this. You're destined to be in the time zone and the time age frame that you are now by God's design. You're not here by the will of man, John 1, 12, or by bloods or the will of the flesh. You're not here because of that. How many people get raped and they don't get fall pregnant, yet some people fall pregnant? Where does that life come from? It comes from God. So all the abortions are killing. They're killing God's plan. How about I was raped? God gives life. God gives life. There are married couples that never speak to the Lord about that. He's got a plan. He's not making a plan. He's not punishing you. All right. Be confidential. The next criteria is to lose your life. Remember what we spoke about last week? You've got to be a loser. You've got to lose your opinion. You've got to lose what you think and say, Lord, what you say. I'm going to lose my life for him. All right, now I want you to go to our text for this morning. That was intro. That one's for free. Okay, I'll send the offering baskets around from this one. Okay. Chapter 17, verse 1. Now after six days, G Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother. Okay, so if you read that wrong, you're going to think John is Jesus' brother. It's not Jesus' brother. It is James, his brother. All right? So jo John, James and John are brothers in this instance. He's saying that so that you don't confuse yourself with the other James, which is Jesus' half-brother. All right? The book of James is written by Jesus' half-brother. Okay, so he's defining which James by saying John, his brother. Led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured, transformed before them. His countenance changed. He shined with glory. Listen to what it says. His face shines as the sun and his garments became white as light. Now that had to happen. I want you to place yourselves there. What's the first thing you're going to do? Well, I'll put money on it. You'll hit the bottom of that mountain very quick. Baleka. We'll be honest. Not many of us would just stay there. The fear would come. There would be a fearful thing that will come over us. Now, hold on. Don't go too fast. Okay. You see, Moses had the same thing. They had to cover his face. Remember that? Cover his face. Remember when he came down from the mountain, they couldn't even look upon him. What do you think happened to Adam in the Garden of Eden? That is a glow, glow, glow in the night torch. 
The animals were kept away from him. It looked like fire. Because of the glory of God shining on him, shining through him. You see, this transforms. Jesus being the Moses was transformed. The burning bush. Think of that incident. It's this fire, the glory of God. God wants us to experience something. All right. And his clothes became white like light, shining in front of them, in front of them. How many people, all his disciples? No, three of his disciples. Three close friends. You see, we've got in our society, and especially for the young people that need to hear this, and you need to hear this clearly, in our society, they are promoting a culture of fame and celebrity status. And if you don't have that, you're not good enough. Jesus had three people in his life that he could trust with everything. He didn't have a Facebook profile with 5,000 people or a TikTok profile with 100,000 followers. He preached one day and he said, this is my body. Eat, this is my blood. Drink, and if you don't have that, you've got nothing in me. And 5,000 people turned around and walked away. And Jesus turned to his disciples and says, are you going to leave me too? He's not worried. And they say to him, sir, where will we go with you are the words of life? He said, when we stick with you, we know what life is about. We've got life. Three of those people he deemed confidential enough close enough to say, come with me up this mountain. I'm going to show you something in the glory of God. I want to transform your life. I want to give you a spiritual experience that will awaken you. God wants, are you ready for that? Because he wants to do it in your life. He wants to do it in your life. Now let's go to the next one. Thank you, Andre. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Okay, so now we come to an interesting part of the scripture. Very interesting. The Bible forbids us to speak to the dead. Okay? Whether by mediums, seans, boans, I don't know. All the answers. The Bible forbids us to speak to the dead. Okay? So if you've gone to a medium or you are a medium, you need to repent. Okay? The Bible forbids this. So, but then how come can Jesus talk sorry, to Moses and Elijah? I want you to see it says talking with him and not them. Can you see the difference? It doesn't say Moses and Elijah spoke to them. They were present but spoke to him. You see, Jesus is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. All right? Elijah and Moses is in heaven alive. And God of the universe speaks here. And they speak to him. They're not speaking to the people. All right. Are you following the hierarchy, the clear cut lines the Lord put in place? Why? For your protection. He loves you. Because the message of God will come and be uplifting. It will be edifying. It will be motivating. Ephesians 4.29 says, let your words when you speak be uplifting and edifying and motivating to the people that hear them. So if God expects that from us, then he does that. He never expects anything of us that he doesn't do. Wilco, but in the Old Testament, the prophets were so harsh. Yes, and every time you can go read, just read past the harshness, it will come to a place. But if you will repent... I will turn from my anger and I will bless you. You see, people get stuck on that. Look look at the angry God. No, 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 no. Sin needs punishment. And death is the punishment for sin. So when death does not equate as the punishment, it equals the grace of God, the unmerited favor of the holiest of holiest of God, that sin cannot come near him. He hates sin. 
There is no darkness in him. So when he has grace and mercy on people in the Old Testament and today, because they're not dying of their sin, you can't say, oh, but you know, it doesn't make sense. It is called unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. And they were talking to him. Now Moses represents the law, the whole law. You know where the law points? To Jesus. See, the law says that you cannot be good enough to come into God's presence. Because if you fail in one, you fail in the whole law. You've broken the law. Therefore, you would go to hell. Moses points to Jesus saying, you can't do it, you need Jesus. Elijah represents the prophets. Where did the prophets point? To Jesus. So this is Moses and Elijah speaking, the prophet and the law speaking to the Messiah. Let's go to the next one. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, if it's good for us to be here, and if you want us, we'll make three tabernacles, one for the, you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So he wanted to make like tabernacles. There goes old Peter, just being Peter. He's just being Peter. Lord, let's just do something about it. Lord, if there's water, let me walk on it. You know? Lord, I won't deny you. Lord, Lord you, I'll just chop your ear off. That's Peter being Peter. Just love seeing his character. Let's go to the next point. While he was speaking, and I want you to see this, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Hear him. For some other reason, the Trinity doesn't appear on the earth all the time. There are only two incidents, incidences that I have found where the Trinity is on the earth at the same time. Jesus' baptism, remember, was baptized. The Holy Spirit came down like a dove and the Father spoke from the cloud. The second one is this. Jesus is there. He was already in a state of glory. Now there's a bright glory coming, the Holy Spirit and the voice of the Father. This is a profound place. He says, he, he adds, he says, I want you to listen to my son. Stop listening to yourself. Stop listening to the pastor. Stop listening to doctrine. Stop listening to the news. Stop listening to some researcher, some, some guru on YouTube. Listen to my son. Hear him when he speaks. Because he will bring you the words of life. And also, you can tap into the Spirit, not by the Spirit of God. And you will hear a wrong message. You'll hear a message that will induce fear. The message of God doesn't bring fear. Listen to the next one. But while, sorry, was that, where am I now? Okay, thank you, Andre. Okay. And when the disciples heard it, they fell where? Backwards. Were they slain in the spirit? They fell on their face. I battle to find where people fall on their back because of the spirit of God. Two, two places they fall on their face. The garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus said, I am him, they fell on their face. Yeah, and when they heard this, the disciples heard this voice, they fell on their face and were, I like this translation, sore afraid. Who have you been sore afraid before? I mean, let me tell you a story. If you haven't heard this one, I know that. Okay. I was about 11 years old, staying with my granny. Me and my brother were staying with my granny. And we were home alone. And at that time, there was a bit of riots were starting, and, 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 and. And so this one night, there's this knocking at the, some window in the back of the house. Where I ran to the neighbors like nobody's business. My Buddha, myself, we're out there. We didn't even close the door. We didn't close the gates. And three, three neighbors down, and we go in there. So, so afraid. So afraid. So it turned out to be a, a, a stray cat. Um, 
And then Jesus came and touched them. What does touch do? Touch brings comfort. I mean, when Jesus touches your life, it will bring comfort. It will bring peace to you. He will bring peace to you. He will bring comfort to you. He will take away the anxiety and the fear. And listen to what he says. And he said, arise, be not afraid. Is when God brings you a message, it will never leave you scared. It will never leave you in, oh, I don't want this to happen in my life. It will leave you with a sense of comfort and peace because he's the prince of peace. To leave you afraid is outside his character. And that's where you can know when somebody is of God and not of God. When a preacher is of God and not of God. Does he leave you with a sense of peace? Or is he enticing fear, evoking fear? Oh, the end of the world's coming. No, no. Jesus is coming. Are you following? No, repent, turn or burn. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Can you hear the difference? The one brings you peace. The other one brings fear. God motivates by love, not by fear. It's not his currency. Be not afraid. Let's go to the next one. And lifting up their eyes, they say, saw no one save Jesus only. Now it's only the four of them again. And this spiritual experience, this experience in God's glory, gone. It happened. How long? We don't know. Peter was willing to stay there and work there. I want you to get that. He was willing to stay in that place and work in that place, building three altars. He was willing to stay there and work. Are you willing to stay in the presence of God? Are you willing to labor in the presence of God? So you need to be want that. You must want that. Let's go on. And as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man has risen. Confidentiality. Can you see there? See, I've taken you. I've given you a spirit experience. I want you to have confidentiality. It is not Kairos time yet. When I get up from the grave, I want you to start spreading this. Confidentiality gets tested. One word, skinner. One word. So if that is God's criteria, what do you think my criteria should be? Exactly the same. I can't trust you if I find you skinnering. Can't. Can't promote you if I find skinnering. Can't release you in this congregation. If I find you scunnering, I want you to know there are only few people in this church that I have released to minister to people in this church, and they will minister to you in front of the church. They will not minister to you in a coffee shop. They will not minister with you in the parking lot. They will not minister to you somewhere by the beach under the auspices of living word. Because they have, listen then, confidentiality, integrity. They will minister to you, yeah. Does that make sense? Everything that is sanctioned under, this is not control, this is called protection. All right? It's called protection. Because we want to protect you. If somebody comes to you and they have not been released, don't take their word. And if you find somebody doing that, then all you do is, come on, come on, come so why are you doing this? It's not of God. It's not of God. Because Jesus submits. He says, I do nothing I don't see my father do. I say nothing which I don't hear my father say. He submits. So we therefore in this house, we submit. I submit to head office. I submit to Fani Kutzer. I submit to Marius van Staden. I submit to Leon Labas I submit to Chris Swanepoel. And I submit to my leadership, my team, my ministry team. If you don't want to submit... This is not the place for you. It's a place of submission. We follow. We live the word, living word. 
Look at how confidential Jesus finds these men. He says, boys, I'm going to take you into some glorious experience. You're going to see me transformed, but you're going to tell no one until it's time. Let's go on. I want you to see how confidentiality will influence your ministry and your calling. And his disciples asked him, saying, when the scribes say that Elijah must first come, and he answered and said, Elijah indeed comes and will restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah has come already. And they knew him not, but they did unto him whatever they would. Even so they shall of the Son of Man, uh, even so shall the Son of Man also suffer under them. They understood the disciples that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. See, John the Baptist was so confidential that even into death, he didn't say, I am Elijah. You see, John the Baptist had spiritual experiences. John the Baptist, remember the words he said? The one that said to me, on whom you see the dove descend, that's the Messiah. That's a spiritual experience. Jesus comes to be baptized by John the Baptist. So he's had a lot of experiences in the spirit. Why? Because of confidentiality. Even to death, he didn't say, I am. And when they asked him, he said, I'm not. But was he lying? No. He was saying, I'm not allowed to permit you to know. I am confidential. Dudley tells me something. So you come to me and say, what's going on with Dudley? I don't know. My confidentiality. You see, I don't have the authority to release that. You've seen, if some of you have seen me, you've asked me questions and I get that expression on my face. But I'm going to take no for because it's got nothing to do with you. You've seen that before. It's like, really? Do you have to ask me? <laughs> I'm not going to tell. I'm going to be confidential. So stop asking. If it's got something to do with you, I'll tell you. Right? You see, I want to show you some examples. Because I want to lead to a place of ministry this morning. I know the time's ticking. And I'm not going to honor time. I'm going to honor the Holy Spirit this morning. Is that okay with you? Are you all comfortable? A bit hot? Must I put the aircons on for you? Everybody happy? See, why would God do this? Why would God give you a spiritual experience? Let's go to Romans 8.17. You see, if you are children, if you and I are children of God, John 1.12 says that you are the children of God if you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Okay? So you are then children of God. If you are then children of God, then you are heirs. Erfgenaam is the Afrikaans word. Heirs. Okay. Then heirs of what God's got to give. And joint heirs with Christ. See, Jesus has the spiritual experience. He wants you to have it. You're an heir to that. It's part of your inheritance. Is to have experiences in His glory. If your life goes past and you have not had a spiritual experience or glory experiences in his glory, you have missed out on the best times in life. Every now and then, when I'm praying in my house alone, I'll have a Holy Ghost party. You can ask my wife, I come jumping in my bed. Yes! Singing my lungs out. And God shows me stuff and puts scriptures and stuff. And he there's an experience in his glory. Years ago, I had a men's, a men's prayer thing. Only one great guy came ever. Old Oki, for probably a year, a friend of mine. And one day we're praying, and the whole room is filled with cloud. The whole room is just a cloud in God's presence. Tangible cloud. Experiences in his glory. You see, because we are heirs to that. If we are heirs to suffer with him, then we'll also be glorified with him. That we might have glorious stuff. There is suffering as well that will go with that. <coughs> Sorry. 
Lot and his family. Remember when the angels visited Lot and his family in the middle of Sodom and Gomorrah saga? That experience in God's glory. Hagar, Sarah's maid when she fell pregnant by Abraham. And then Sarah got jealous and chased Hagar away. Angels came to her and said, listen, Ishmael will be blessed. These 12 tribes, 12 nations coming from Ishmael. Jacob and the ladder. Remember Jacob and the ladder. Remember Jacob wrestling with God the whole night. Spiritual experiences in God's glory. Israel, when they came out of Egypt, it, God's glory guided them. Full of a fire by night and a pillar of cloud. Gideon, when God came to the least of the least, saying, listen, mighty warriors, says, Lord, you're making a mistake. This is the guy from Randfontein, next to the railway track, next to the bridge. This is the guy from, let me get it right, Witbank. Okay? This Witbank's a sign. You got it? Witbank, Poppy. Witbank. Ne? Modderfontein. <laughs> Wrong guy, Lord. No, no. Presence of God it gives him experience in the glory. Remember the cloth, the wet one, the dry one, and the wet one? Experiences God's glory. Manau's wife. Anyone know who Manau's? Nanny? Samson's mother. Manau was his father's name. Had a visitation. You're going to be pregnant. You're going to bring forth a son. He's going to be a deliverer. He's going to be Samson. Our angel spoke to Elijah. Hezekiah, when he begged for his life, was a glorious experience. Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, remember him? He wanted to. The angel came and said, You're going to, be, you're going to have a glorious experience. You're going to be, your wife's going to be pregnant. You call him John. And then he argued and he got muted for nine months. Remember? Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel's friends in the, in, the, in the fire furnace. Having an experience in God's glory. Joseph, the husband of Mary. When he was contemplating, the, he has this woman he's going to take as his wife and suddenly she's pregnant. And she's telling him it's the Holy Spirit. He probably thought you had too much spirits, woman. Do I look like a fool? He had experience. Mary, when she became pregnant, said, Lord, I know not a man. How's this going to happen? Well, don't worry. But not my will laying down her life. Your will be done. The shepherds, minding their own business, unmerited favor, the angels start declaring, hark. Remember that? We've got a song. The apostles in the prison, when the doors open, they're praying and suddenly angels visit. The glory of God comes down. The doors jump open and they walk out. Visitation of God. Peter's chains, Acts 12, verse 7. Peter was praying. He's locked up. <coughs> chains just fall off him. Experiencing God's glory. I love this. When Paul was on the ship and there was turbulence, and the ship's about to sink, and Paul, it says, an angel came. Comfort me. She was. I want you to understand, none of these men were after the glory of God. They were after God. They were after Jesus, seeking his heart. Then comes the glory. It's part of our inheritance. It's part of what God wants to do in your life. Is there a hunger in your heart? Is there a hunger in your heart? What is there that you need to lay down? Is there a habit that you need to lay down? Is there confidentiality that I need to sort out and repent of my in confidentiality? Is there pride, thinking I know everything? Because it's intellectual exercise. Or is there a hunger in you to say, I want more of you, Saul? More of you. I want to hear from you. I don't want to hear from a man. I don't want to hear from a pastor or a prophet. I want to hear from you. I want to have experiences in your glory because you are my father. You are my Lord. Come on, speak. 
we'll just remain in this place. Because the presence of the Lord is here. And I know that the Lord wants to visit people this morning. I'm going to ask the ministry team to come to the front. And if you want us to pray with you, and you hunger, hunger for a spiritual experience, of experiencing God's glory, come stand in front of anyone that you see standing in front of you. And it's not about them. They know this morning. Their prayer is not going to be I, 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 ack, ack, ack. Their prayer is going to be Lord, Lord, Lord. Father, we exalt you. We thank you for your presence. It's only two people that hunger. And there's me. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Are you ready for experience in his glory? It's your inheritance. It's your right. His grace, how sweet the sound. Sing a breath like me. Once was lost, but now I'm found. It's like while you see the dead in Where you seated there in your chairs. I want you to be in prayer this morning, please. Please respect the Holy Spirit. He is here this morning. I don't want you to chat. I don't want you to look around. Just bow your heads. Or you can look and pray. Just pray for the people in front. Father, we exalt you. We thank you for your presence. Thank you, Jesus. For your glory, your glory, your glory, your glory, your glory, your glory, your glory. Your glory. Glory, your glory. Are you ready for experiences in His glory? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank Jesus, our God. Set free. No one else hungering for more of God. You hunger for more of God. You want to experience? Come, there's one more person to pray for you. Don't be shy. Come, now is the time. Don't miss out on this. 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 Father, we thank you for Holy Spirit, your presence. And your tangible glory in this place. We're not going to counsel you in front of you. We're going to pray with you. We're going to ask the Lord just to come and touch you. That's all. We're going to ask the Lord to touch you. You might have an experience. More of Him. More of Him. Oh, it grieves the Lord. Do not hunger for the Lord. Hunger, Lord. Create a hunger for Him. Hunger, people. A hunger. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we exalt you. We exalt you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. More of you, Lord. More of you. More of you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Your Spirit will fill us. That same Spirit that met Moses on the mountain. That same Spirit that's in the bush. That same Spirit that was with them in the fire furnace. Wants to visit you at your air, co air that saves you. That same Spirit that comforted Jesus. The same Spirit that comforted Paul on that boat. That same Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to challenge you. Don't just sit there and be a spectator. Be a participant. Be somebody that wants to taste of the glory of God. We're not looking at you. You're not going to be feel ashamed. You're wrapped in God's glory. I want to challenge you. Come to the front. Come experience. Put your faith out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. More of your glory. More of your glory. Don't put flesh to spirit. Don't put flesh to spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God's doing his work. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. More of you, Lord. More of you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Take courage and come to the front. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid this morning. Take courage and come to the front. It is your inheritance as child of God. Jesus, we thank you for your presence. Shout your praise, it's for 
Let's get out some coffee. 